Hello everyone, my name is Barbara and I would like to welcome you all to our latest Novich webinar episode. In this week's episode, meet Vectorworks Landmark 2015. The author of this residential garden design with Vectorworks Landmark, Tamsin Slatter, will be taking the opportunity to show some of the fantastic new features available within Vectorworks Landmark 2015. She'll be demonstrating the improvements to the planting and tree tools roadway site modeling, and even show you how to use the new curtain wall feature within the wall tool. So today's presenter, you can see, is Tamsin. She heads up the largest Vectorworks reseller company in the UK, with a team of trainers and consultants on hand to help her clients make the most of their investment. Before we get going, here's an overview of what we do in Novage. Novage is one of the largest online stores for design software. We offer a huge assortment of software solutions that cater to virtually every designer's need. Put us to the test and come visit our webpage at novage.com. And here's Tamsin's book, Residential Garden Design with Vectorworks Landmark. Now it's on its sixth edition. Wow. For more detailed software news and limited type promotion, pay a visit to the Novage blog and follow us on Facebook, Google Plus, and Twitter. And coming up next week, a look into the new Maxwell Render V3.1. Take a detailed look at the new cool features in Maxwell Render V3.1, a free upgrade to the V3 users. We will demo the new features and improvements that help to make your workflow more efficient. Last but not least, today's webinar is free and it's being recorded live. If you want to watch this or any webinar episode in our collection, just head over to Novage's YouTube or Vimeo channels. And now I'm going to pass the baton to Tamsin, and okay. um, it's our show after all, so you should be prompt to share your screen, and um, everybody okay. should be able to see it in a second. Excellent. Right. So I've shared my screen, so hopefully everybody can now see... Um, a little design which is in no way attempting to be a um, fantastic design it's just a file that I've actually put together to show off a few new features um, and I have several of these that we'll, we'll just look through first of all I want to thank Barbara for that lovely introduction um, and in fact I'm going to flip over to show you the file that uh, Barbara mentioned my book, which is Residential Garden Design with Vectorworks Landmark. I have just finished the seventh edition of the book um, and sent it over to Nemeth's Check for publishing. So it's ready to publish, but you can see on your screen now the visual that shows you what the book takes you through to create. So it's very much a residential thing, but in this year's edition, it includes a lot of the new features, such as the curtain wall tool, and the curtain wall tool actually is something that um, has been brought about by uh, a, a need within the architect community. It's something that they need to create large commercial buildings. Um, but I've found it great fun to use as well in the landmark space, in, in the landscape design. So I've used it here on this building just to create this kind of glazed extension that you might find on a typical residential building. And I also used it to create this glazed balustrade just along the edge of the terrace. So we will have a look at that. And I've also found another innovative use for it in the landscape space, which you'll see a bit later. Um, but I'll just show you through some of the visuals that, you, you, uh, that would show you what you would be able to create with the book as and when it is published. Um, when that is, we'll have to wait for Nemeth's check to do their stuff at their end. But as far as I'm concerned, it's good to go. So you can see there some of the new features which we'll be talking about in, new, in detail. Things like being able to display hatches on the surface of objects um, in a rendered view, which is very, very useful and a great time saver. Um, I'm showing edges in that view as well. But you saw earlier there um, a rather nice artistic view of a model which is also including some planty effects there. Um, so I'll, I'll show you a bit more about that later on. Um, the book will also take you through creating hardscape details. So for, um, for example, here, there's a section through a stair, and you do get a new stair tool with Vectorworks Landmark, which is something that was previously available uh, only to the architect community, but now has been added to the Landmark workspace. Um, 
so I'll show you that as well. But we also have um, here the planting plan. There are some improvements to planting, as Barbara mentioned. So this is just the planting plan for the book, uh, presented in black and white, but that can easily be changed. And then finally, um, the other thing that the book will take you through is using that model to generate an accurate setting out plan for those of you who are passing off plans to contractors for building or even setting out and building yourselves on site. Um, now one of the disadvantages of running a webinar with so many people on is that I'm not getting you talking to me and answering me so I'm kind of having to guess a little bit about you so that's why I said to Barbara I'll be more than happy to take questions and comments throughout the webinar as we go through so that um, I can just be sure that I'm, I'm giving the right information to the right people. So anyway, that's the residential garden design book and um, so I'm going to flip back to the model that I showed you earlier. Now one of the first great improvements is that the, um, the, when you change your view to a 3D view now, I'm going to go to a left isometric view, you can see there the model is immediately rendered in OpenGL. I don't have to wait, I don't have to look at the wireframes view, and I don't have to go to the render mode menu each time I want to generate that 3D view. So that's a massive time saver. If we open up the OpenGL options here, I'm going to turn on, I'm going to improve the quality of that uh, render, and I will also turn on the shadows, and that will render again now. So we'll see that uh, looking a little bit more uh, high quality, but also seeing shadows from our trees. Um, but one of the lovely new features within OpenGL, which is quite cool, is the ability to turn off colors but retain textures. Now, you're possibly thinking, if you are a RenderWorks user, you may be thinking, well, why would I still want textures and not colors? If you think about a RenderWorks texture, it has many components. It has the basic color but it also has the ability to reflect light, it has the ability to allow light to pass through it in terms of its transparency settings, and it also has bump. Now OpenGL can't cope with all of those things, but what it can do is strip out the color, but leave other elements of the textures running. So that's going to just render again. I'm going to turn off the colors um, and, oh, in fact, oh goodness me, one of the marvelous things about a live demo is that Vectorworks has just crashed. So that's always wonderful. What I'm going to do is um, I can just flick over to some slides that I have while we wait for that to come back up, which will just talk about um, one of the other new features, which is to do with the position of your model um, in relation to the origin. Now if you're a residential designer and you may have come to Vectorworks Landmark from a paper-based system in the past, um, you may be very used to just drawing on a piece of paper and Vectorworks Landmark is great, it lets you just do that, it lets you treat your drawing area as a piece of paper, but if you are working on larger projects or you're in a project where you're perhaps collaborating with other professionals, it can be quite important to line up your files correctly um, and not move the geometry. So one of the things that's changed, um, and I have a nice slide here to show you, one of the things that's changed is that we have um, the ability to now see the internal origin, which you should be able to see in the middle of that snapshot of the drawing area there. And I love to work with this turned on because it gives me a nice indication of where zero is as far as Vectorworks is concerned. So if I'm bringing in, um, I'm bringing in an external file, it's quite important to Vectorworks to know where that internal origin is. Uh, there is also a separate origin system called the user origin. And when you open up a file, a blank file, those two origin systems, those two, two coordinate systems are completely aligned. However, 
when you import a, a DWG file now, you'll see that there is a location tab available. And um, there is a new option there, which is it's actually not a new option. It's always been there on the, it used to be on the primary settings tab, which is to center the first import and then align all subsequent imports with that new user origin. So um, what that actually means, I've got some slides here to show you. Um, if I bring in, let's say I bring in a site plan from uh, some mapping data that perhaps I've downloaded, that information may well have been located far and far and far away from the middle of my Vectorworks drawing or my Vectorworks page, if you like. Um, and Vectorworks will take that and position it over that internal origin for me. And that's nothing new. It's always done that. But we now have that clear indicator in the middle of the screen there that shows us where the original origin was. But you can see that the x and y coordinates of the geometry are preserved. So if we were to send this back out again to somebody who's using a different CAD system, then the x and y coordinates would be preserved and they wouldn't be cross with you for moving things, which would be important. Now, that's, we've also got a little indicator where the rulers meet, showing us that the origin has been moved, and that's now glowing yellow, which for, from my point of view and my team of trainers and consultants, that's a fantastic visual indicator that something has changed in this file. And you can see I've zoomed out here, and we can see where the site is. It's just a little dot on the screen now but we can see the internal origin and we can now see the new user origin, the new zero, is actually some distance away from that. But what's really important is that when I now import another file, if I take that recommended option, it will not shift the user origin again. So to put that into context, if I'm now bringing in some points which need to line up with that original site, and maybe these are points I'm going to use for 3D height data, they are going to import relative to the new zero and everything will remain aligned. So it won't just keep shifting time after time. Um, the other thing that I should mention at this stage is that um, the uh, Vectorworks for some years now has been able to geo-reference. So it is also important, uh, it, it is also possible for you to use longitude and latitude coordinate systems overlaid onto um, that internal origin. So uh, my tips for keeping project data aligned are don't move the geometry, let Vectorworks align it for you, but only if you're absolutely certain that that geometry is located where it should be, and always talk to other people in your project team to agree on how this geometry should align before you start modeling or drafting. Um, but it's something that there's no, there's no definite answer as the correct way to do it because projects will be different and people have, will have different files set up in different ways. So what's really important is to talk to each other and get yourselves organized. So let's see how Vectorworks is doing now. And the marvelous news is it has rebooted itself, so that's great. So if I just pop back to my Vectorworks files and what I can do is open up the file that we were looking at. In fact, I'm going to go in and look at a, a different one here. I'm going to go to the um, Trees and Roads file. Now, I don't know if any, any of you use the existing tree tool. Um, certainly, if you're working on large landscape projects, the existing tree tool is invaluable for documenting existing trees. If you're performing tree surveys, for, exa for example, it's absolutely invaluable. Um, but it's also handy for those smaller residential projects as well, where you might want to accurately depict the canopy shape so that you can work out um, light and shade, how it's going to affect your design, etc. So we're going to have a look at some of the improvements to this. Um, I'm just going to pop down to the irregular canopy settings. Now in here, what you can see is in the past, um, in the previous iterations of this tool, the, um, you, you were only able to specify 
two different diameter settings. So if your tree wasn't entirely circular, as trees that have been growing for many years may not be, it was very difficult to you, for you to represent that accurately because you could only have a diameter width ways and a diameter height. So all the trees would be oval or circle. Um, but now you have the ability to specify the radius as an offset from the center of the trunk, which is certainly how we do things here in the UK. And the British standard expects you to be able to define your tree in that way. So you now have, as I say, if I select this tree and open up, you can see it has very specific canopy information there. What else has changed um, is that that also is represented in 3D. So you saw earlier, where we were looking at the entire model, that the complete tree was, um, was, was being displayed, um, with the, the heads were actually modeled according to those values. There's also now um, the ability to record information about multi-stem trees, which we didn't have before. It won't actually model multiple stems for you, but what you're really interested in here is recording that data accurately so that when you produce your ex existing tree report, that data is, inf is correctly inf um, represented in the information. Um, there are new options now for the tree protection zone. And the tree protection area, certainly here in the UK, we use um, the calculation of 12 times diameter at breast height. So that is now being calculated correctly. So certainly here we can um, assign that to the correct standards. So that's marvelous. But what's also fantastic is that you now have the ability to use up to 10 additional fields on the existing tree tool. So if for, for any reason the tool doesn't quite meet your needs and you have other bits of information that you need to record about existing trees, you can activate up to 10 fields. So here we've got seven being displayed in the object info palette and we can specify exactly what we want to record in there. So that's marvelous. But also, you have additional arborist fields here. So you can choose to have the form, structure, and vigor recorded, and also buttress and structural root zone, etc. So um, very, very powerful options now in terms of recording that. Um, as I say, if you're working on some res more residential projects, this, tree, this tool could be complete overkill. And I don't want to frighten anyone who's considering Landmark for residential projects into thinking that you have to supply all this information. Of course you don't. If it's not relevant for your project, you don't have to use that at all. Um, but I'm just going to go to the new 3D tools um, and what you can see there, I was talking about the, the different canopy shapes and because we have irregular canopies, um, you can see there that they have been fairly accurately modeled. What's also lovely is that the developer of this tool has added in a rather nice texture for the 3D models. In the previous release, these would always appear as solids and so they could also look a bit out of place when you started creating other elements on the design. So there's a very nice transparent texture there that gives you some rather lovely shadows when you render with render works. But there it even looks rather nice just in OpenGL. And even the trunks have a texture on them as well. So if I just zoom in there, you can see they've got a rather nice representation. So they just look a bit better than they used to which is great news. Um, I'm going to go now and have a look at the roadway tool. Now, I'm going to ask a question knowing I most likely won't get an answer here, but has anybody ever tried to create accurately curved roads with Vectorworks Landmark in the past? Well, it, we always had a selection of roadway tools. So I've just gone into the site modeling tool set and what I'm doing now is I'm just showing you the different ways that you can create a road. Now, in the past, we had the uh, roadway T, we had roadway straight, we had roadway nerbs, and we had roadway 
curved. So the curved, straight and T sections are fantastic if you want to kind of snap together sections of roads uh, based on very precise pieces, almost as if you were uh, using a scale electrics or something similar to create your roadway. To create more organic curves, you had the roadway nerves, and those tools are still there for you. However, um, we now have the roadway poly tool, and I'm just going to click on that now, and you can see here we have the same drawing functions now as if you were just drawing yourself a 2D polyline, but you can now create very accurate curves across the site, and they will always end with a nice 90 degree tangent. Now I'm going to say I don't want to do that, but you can see there that's very accurately given me a single section of roadway which I could then send to the surface of my site. I can show the stations on that roadway and I could then adjust the height points of each of those individual stations and create more points if necessary. So I have another uh, view to show you with that um, because there is also another fantastic piece of um, roadway geometry here. In fact, let me just take my uh, let me just go back to my previous view. I'm going to delete that road for a second because I have some more roads to show you. But if I go to my custom curb, in the past it was extremely difficult to create uh, junctions into roads and um, to create things like roundabouts, which we have a great deal in here in the UK. Um, I'm just going to pause for a section because I a second because I believe there's a question. Oh, somebody's asking me to speak up. Oh, I thought I was being very noisy, so I do apologise if you can't hear me, Gabrielle. Um, uh, but hopefully that's helping and you can hear me. Okay. Um, right. So I will now have a look at these objects I've drawn here. If you look at my object info palette, I'm creating this rather complex junction by simply drawing out 2D shapes. So this is a rectangle. This is a circle that I've clipped the center out of. It's just a 2D polyline. This is also a 2D polyline, as is this shape here. Now, if I select all of these objects, and what I'm going to do is add surface, just as you would do with any 2D shapes. I've now created the complex junction there that I want, but it's still only 2D, and it doesn't know it's a roadway. So I'm going to go into the landmark menu, and I'm going to run Create Objects from Shapes. Now I'm going to create a roadway custom curb. And I will, at the same time, delete the source shape. Now, this is asking me all about the road that I'd like to create. Um, and essentially, it's going to create for me a curb height of 200 millimeters, a curb width of 200 millimeters, which I can adjust. So I'll maybe make that 100. I can specify the paving thickness, and I could even assign a rise value to this so that my road doesn't have to be entirely flat. Um, and I'm going to also create a grade limit for the site model at the same time. It's going to assign the different parts of the road to different classes for me, which is, which is marvelous. And I'm going to click OK. And what I have there is um, a piece of road which I'm going to send to the surface of my model and you'll see there if I just flick to a 3D view although I haven't updated the site there it has actually moved that to the to the height of the start point of my uh, of my process there and so what I can do is create the grade limit for that and then I'll select the site model and update it. So I'll just force select on there and click update. 
And there you are. That's set my roadway into my land there. It's not an ideal roadway because it's rather hard to get onto, um, but you can see there that it's actually created the junctions exactly as I would want them. I could change the heights of that, etc. And obviously I would need further modifiers to make that successful. But that is one of my favorite tools from 2015 because it is so flexible and it's something that um, will enable you to create, uh, accurately depict your design intent for that. So let's just update the model again, put it back to where it was. That's marvelous. So what else do we have? Um, I have a custom curve. I have another example of that already done. And then I've got a 3D view of that. Um, now this one has some buildings on it as well. And so we'll just look at that and update the model again to accommodate all of those things. So very easy there to create um, access to these buildings. These buildings have been created, by the way, simply using the massing model tool, which is another great tool. I don't know um, those residential designers out there whether you've ever used that, but it's a very blocky way to create a building, but it's very quick and it avoids you having to waste too much time detailing your client's buildings, which are, let's face it, usually already there, and you can concentrate on designing the landscape. Great, so that's what I wanted to show you with the roads and um, the changes to the existing tree tool. So I'm going to go back to my selection of files here and open up the, oh, do we have another question? Yes, Sandin. The yes. one that complained earlier, my poor file that caused me to, um, to crash. There's a question here, how do I deform the custom roadway shape to fit the land instead of projecting the road surface as horizontal? That is a very good question. If I just go back to my uh, example file here, and I'll see. Um, now, the limitation with the custom curb is that it will show you only, it, 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 if I do create the entire road in this way, it is effectively planar in nature. So, um, let me just select that roadway. If I want it to not be entirely flat, then what I can do is put in a rise. So, I would put in a value, let's say I want it to rise by a meter, and then now it is tilting by a meter. But you're quite right, it isn't actually hugging the surface of the model. So what I recommend you do is use these actually just for the junctions. Um, and if I go back to my um, start the roadway polyline, if I just create one for you and I show you what you can do with the, with the new polyline tool, if I just bring that across my site um, and we'll just accept all of the default values on there, I'm going to say no. This time I am going to send this one to the surface. And because this is not a custom curb, it's actually a complete roadway, if we look at this in 3D, what you'll see there is it's actually um, adjusted. It sent itself, hmm, now the site is out of date. So just bear with me while I select the site again. And... I'll just update that. It's still showing the previous uh, modifications. Um, but you can see there that my roadway is actually following the surface much better. It's actually hugging the surface of the site and picking up the original values that were there. But the other thing that I can do with that is I can add additional points. So if I show the stations on here, and we'll just wait for those to be displayed. The stations are the points at which we can affect 
the levels. And there aren't many there at the moment, but I could add further stations. So I could say I'd like them every four meters, for example, and it will now generate further height points. And I can then use the object info palette to navigate through those points and set the values for each one. So I can send them all to the surface of either the existing or the proposed site. So I'm going to send them to the surface of the existing site. And now it's going to do its best to create a roadway that's actually hugging the terrain and not creating too much cut and fill for us. So let me just select the site now and update it. And then we can see on our left view here, there you are. It is, it is doing its very best to map itself to the existing terrain. And then it still needs to be updated, of course, because it has to uh, flatten the site. Um, but I can also um, edit that and change the individual stations as necessary. So you can see here I've got move entire object or I can say move the stations and it's now offering me each station in turn and I can flick through them and I can change their Z value. So you can see, hopefully you can see those changing and they're being highlighted on the model as well. So you then have very fine control over that road. So I do hope that answers your question. Um, if not, please do let me know. Right, um, the other thing that I want to show you, if I can go back to my file, which was being a bit mean to me earlier, um, I have here various bits and pieces that I just want to show you. Uh, again, I've got them set up as saved views just to take me straight to them. Um, the site model, I'm going to start with the site model error indicators, um, which are visible on the, on the site here. Um, can you see these new hazard triangles that have displayed? Anyone who's used site modeling in the past may well have encountered frustration because you add various different modifiers, new pads, new levels across the site and there are certain things that Vectorworks will object to. For example, if you have pads that are touching, it doesn't like that. Now, I have here a hardscape object, which is at one elevation, and then I have actually a, a roadway custom curb, which I've used to create a slope coming up the site here. Now, they are touching. They both have modifiers underneath them, but they are touching. And so instead of receiving a message, which I would have received in the past, which said, you have touching pads on your site, it now tells me where they are, which is a fantastic time saver. So I can see here exactly what the problem is. And I happen to know, because I've created these areas, that they are touching at the same elevation. And therefore, as far as updating my site model, is concerned, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter that I have that issue. And I've got the same problem here. I've got a pad underneath my greenhouse, and I have a pad underneath the path here, which is telling me that pads intersect. But I know, because I've designed this, that it isn't actually going to cause me any problems. It's not going to give me any inaccurate data. If they were touching at different elevations, it would cause me a problem, because the site model cannot have two different elevations at the same point. And therefore, it will choose one of them, and therefore you may not get the site that you are expecting. So those are marvelous indicators. Um, the other thing I want to show you is the OpenGL surface hatches. We mentioned this uh, a little bit earlier, and I've actually created a viewport here that shows you this. So this is an OpenGL render, but within my RenderWorks textures now, I'm able to display, I'm able to map a hatch onto the texture. So if I wish to render my model 
without showing the full brickiness of those bricks, but I just want to show a hatch outline on a 3D model, I no longer have to draw that separately within my viewport. It will just automatically be displayed. And there you have your first view of my other innovative use for the curtain wall tool. Um, I told you earlier that it's been used by, uh, it, it's, it's been brought in mainly for the architectural community, but I've shown you already that I used it for a glazed extension on a residential building. And I also used it to create a glazed balustrade in the file that, that you create with my book. But I've also used it to create this rather lovely greenhouse. So I will go and show you how I did that in a moment. Um, I, we also have some improvements to the landscape area tool. Now, do I don't know if any of you use the landscape area tool, but it is a fabulous way of planting up areas where you don't have time to be individually placing plants. So in plan view, you're literally going to draw the area and have a mixture of planting within there. So I'm going to select this area and go into its settings. And you can see here that I have a variety of different plants included in there. And the landscape area tool is not new at all. Um, what has changed within it is the ability to create a custom tag very easily. So I can go in and just pick whichever fields I'd like to have on my tag. And in this case, I've added to the percentage and ID, I've added the word no for number, and then I've put in a quantity value there. So that's affected the way that the tag is being displayed. So you can completely customize that. But what's also changed is the ability to access plant content. So I'm going to go in to um, add a new plant, and what you'll see here is a list of files. Now, all you have to do is place your own library of plants in a particular location on your hard drive, and then it will always be listed here. No more having to previously import your plants from the resource browser in order to be able to use them in the landscape area. So if I wanted to navigate to any of the plant files that come with Vectorworks, I've just got direct access to all of that content straight from within the tool, which just makes planting so much faster and easier. So I'm going to cancel that. I'm not going to add any more plants at this stage. But the other thing that is new is that the landscape area is now slope aware. So I've created a very steep slope here um, with my uh, greenhouse um, here. I've got a one, one in five grade coming down here. And in the past, um, the landscape area would in fact have ignored the slope there. It would have populated this with plants based purely on the 2D projected area of that, but now it's calculating the values based on the slope. Now, the, to create that slope, I've used the grade tool on my site model, and the grade tool has had an overhaul as well in Vectorworks 2015, which is marvelous, makes it even more usable. Um, this is a tool that you can use to pick two points on your site model. It will do a multitude of things for you. If I open up the settings for this grade, I can use it to simply report elevations and re report the grade change between, between two elevations. But I can also use it to change the site. So in this case, I'm specifying that I want to go from the existing elevation of 1500 at this point, and I want to create a downward ratio, and I can now specify that as a ratio. In the past, you would have had to specify this either as an angle or a percentage, but most of us um, who are designing a slope would specify a rise over run value. So now you can just pop those values in and not have to sit with your calculator and divide one number by the other to get your percentage. So much easier to use. The other thing that's rather nice is it does show you the projected length, but also 
the surface length value, which is so important because the projected length is just the 2D length. If that was going to be um, a drainage run, for example, it would be quite a steep drainage run, but if it was going to be drainage, you need to know the surface length of that, not just the area length. So that's a, a fantastic improvement. Um, and I'm going to flick to a left view here and just show you, um, hopefully it's going to behave and not crash for us again. It doesn't like this file. No, there we are. All is good. So uh, I can see here um, that my landscape area, what I wanted to show you there is that the landscape area has been populated with enough plants to densely plant it, even though it's fairly shallow slope here. Uh, and a very steep slope here, it is planting at the same density. So we're going to get enough plants to cater for our, um, our slope. Now, I promised to show you the, um, the greenhouse in a little bit more detail. So I'm just going to create, I'm just going to open up my navigation palette um, and have a look at the layers that I have available in here. In fact, let's just go straight to my buildings layer and make that um, make that visible. So I've selected the end walls. Now this is actually a, a real greenhouse. I took the manufacturer's information and, and I brought in a PDF which I can show anybody if they don't believe me. But I took the dimensions from that and I've been able to reproduce this greenhouse purely with the use of the wall tool. And uh, we've always had the wall tool, and the wall has been great for creating solid walls. Um, but where you would have quite a complex mixture of glazed panes like this, it was more difficult to achieve. I've also been able to insert a door into the greenhouse, which is inserting partly into the brick area and partly into the glazed area. In the past, you would have had to potentially stack walls to achieve this, and then you would not have been able to insert the door in both parts. So I'm going to go into the wall. If you look on the object info palette at the top right of my screen, you'll see that we now have a new type of wall. We have the standard wall, which is the wall that those of you who've used Factorworks in the past will be fully familiar with. But this is, I've changed this to be a curtain wall. And once it's a curtain wall, we can define it by setting up a grid. And if I go into the curtain wall grid, you can see that I've set vertical grid lines at a spacing of 818 millimeters and horizontal grid lines um, at 762. And I took that information from the manufacturer's technical drawing of this, grain, of this particular greenhouse. Now if I go into the frame settings, you can see here there are lots of terms that if you're not an architect will not mean much to you, but I just urge you to play with these tools because they can give you a very quick visual for something uh, instead of having to model it and, uh, the hard way. So I'd really urge you to, to have a look at that. And I've just used break metal here. But I've been able to specify the texture that I want to use for the frame on there. And if I go into the panel settings, you can see that I have mainly used glazing. And there are different, again, there are terms here that you won't necessarily be familiar with. But a spandrel panel simply means that it's filled. Um, uh, or you can have a completely open panel with nothing in it. But the majority of my panels are glazing, and again, I've chosen a glass texture to achieve that. Now, we have in the Building Shell tool set a new tool called Edit Curtain Wall. And if I click on this, you'll see I'll be able to select individual elements of this. So I can select now this individual panel and look at its properties. And in this case, I've chosen to override this particular panel from the default settings, and I've just made it brick. So it's a solid fill, and it is brick. And so it's been very easy for me to generate that. The roof of the building, I just used the create roof command. and um, 
the uh, and then I've been able to um, add just model in the final pieces on the roof there so it was really easy for me to do now another lovely feature that I want to bring to your attention which has had an overhaul if we look inside my greenhouse you'll see I have some rather lovely vegetable plants in here and I've also got some tulips growing for my cutting garden there I've got some lettuces I've got some onions and I've got some tomato plants now how on earth did I model those well I used the import SketchUp feature um, and you've always been able to import a SketchUp model but it's always been difficult to retain the textures so what I'm going to do now is create a completely blank file and I'm going to bring in a SketchUp model that I have downloaded from the SketchUp warehouse. Um, and you know there's a, a vast array of content there, but I'm going to show you how you can bring that in and just make it look fabulous using the far superior rendering and modeling powers within Vectorworks itself. So I am going to go to the import menu. And you can see there, you can import a huge range of files, file types, as you've always been able to do. But I'm going to pick out SketchUp. Now, um, if I go to the folder where I've saved everything, let's just find that. I have a hoof house here, which somebody has gone to great pains to model um, in SketchUp. So if I'm working with a client who has a hoof house, I don't need to model it, I can just go and get a model. Now I'm going to bring it in using the simple method, I don't need to do anything complicated here, but the new feature with 2015 is that I can bring in the materials that are assigned to that model. And I'm going to have it create RenderWorks textures for all of the materials. And it will have a quick look at that. And there we are, that was pretty speedy. Being a SketchUp model, the geometry is messy. It is um, edges and faces, that's all you get with SketchUp. Um, but I'm going to look at that in 3D now. And I mentioned to you earlier that you, you now have a default OpenGL render. You're in a perspective view immediately. So I'm just going to swivel around that. So that's looking not bad. Um, I'm just going to apply uh, fast render works to that so we can see it slightly better than an OpenGL render and it looks kind of okay but what I'm going to do is have a look in my resource browser now and look at the um, information in the active file and we have here now a texture that's been created for every single material in that model now I'm going to take the glass texture and I'm going to edit that, which will open it up in the RenderWorks Texture Editor. And I don't know if you are familiar with RenderWorks Texture Editing, but what we have here is a base color, which is just gray. I'm quite happy to leave that as it is. But I'm going to change the reflectivity to glass, which is something that SketchUp doesn't have built into it. And I'm going to change the transparency to glass which gives RenderWorks a lot more information to go on and it's going to make this texture just work so much better for us. Now I'm going to go to the visualization tools and I'm going to just go to get myself a, a BB visual plant. Um, now as a Vectorworks service select member I've got access to lots of plants here which is fantastic, but um, I'm just going to pick, uh, what should we go for? I'll just go for a two meter little tree. I just want to pop something in the front of my model here, just for speed, so that we have something that can reflect in our scene. And uh, we'll just go for OpenGL again, just so I can get myself in a nice 3D view. Um, that should do. Now I'm going to do nothing else to this model apart from deselect my tree so it's not orange. And I'm going to go to one of the RenderWorks styles and I'm going to choose Realistic Colors White. 
Now this is a collection of RenderWorks settings which is going to make the most of all of the texture settings in my model with the exception of the color. So it's going to turn off all color but everything else like the bump shaders and the transparency are still going to do their job. And this will render fairly quickly, so I'm just going to have to talk over this for a while. If anyone's got any questions, now would probably be a good time to fire them at me. Um, but there you can see that rendering before your very eyes. And I personally think that looks fantastic. It's a fantastic way of showing a concept to a client without them getting too bogged down in detail but that glass looks so much better than it ever did in SketchUp. We haven't got those quite ugly textures really, um, but what you can see is that that tree and the surrounding fence, those are reflecting in the glass. We're able to see through and it's all looking rather lovely and we've got a very softened lighting effect there. So that, that is showing you one of the new features in RenderWorks which is to turn off all of the textures and um, turn off all of the color channel within those textures so whether they're created from images or basic colors they can just be turned off but everything else can do its job so um, I'm going to go back to show you just to finish up now before we take some questions I'm going to go back to my greenhouse model and I have some um, views set up on on my sheet here just to talk you through how you can make the most of some of those options there. So here, um, I don't know if you can see, but we've got the bump channel activated there. Um, and um, you can, so the, the color is not showing, but we can see the indentation in the paving. And you can just see the mottled surface of the grass there. But the greenhouse is still working as um, as a glazed surface even though we've got no color here and you can also see the bump on the bricks there is is doing its job um, I've also got a sketchy edge render turned on here because one of the other nice features is you can combine photorealistic and artistic uh, styles together now and if I look in the um, resource browser here and we'll have a look at the render styles, which will be above my textures. Let's just open those up. Here we've got that collection of settings, and you can see I've got here, uh, textures are turned on, but colors are turned off. The quality is all medium, so that we don't have to wait for ages. We've got um, all the properties of a realistic render we have, indirect lighting bouncing once which is giving us that lovely softened down feeling but we're also able to combine that with artistic edges which I think is a, a lovely feature. Um, and just to con contrast there, here is a, a much more photorealistic. I've got the colors turned back on in the textures but I've also added the sketchy edge um, and then down here I have just a sort of traditional photorealistic render you can see the water there is reflecting. Um, and then here, as I, I mentioned earlier, I've got just an OpenGL render um, with the plants acting as cutouts beautifully. Again, we've just got the, um, the, the transparency mask on those plants. It's still doing its job, but they are just behaving as cutouts. So that's about everything that I wanted to show you, um, but um, I'm more than happy to take questions now if anybody would like to um, would like to ask. So, how did I create the pivoting windows in the greenhouse? A question there from Garrett. So, I'm just going to take a look at that, and I'll go back to my greenhouse model. Let's just go to my buildings layer, and I'll show you how I did those. So, on this wall here, again, it is just a wall but the type is curtain wall and I created a series of panels so in the same way I used the grid uh, so we have the vertical spacing and the horizontal uh, grid lines there but 
Um, with the curtain wall, the edit curtain wall tool, what you can do is you can select a specific panel, right click on it, and you can insert a door or a window. And once you've done that, the door or window will automatically size itself to the size of the panel. And if I now select that window, just with my selection tool, you'll see it's just an ordinary window. So I can go into the settings of this, and I basically changed it to be a hopper. So that's how it's a, a tilting window. But you can see here within the window, we have the new option there, which is curtain wall window. Um, so obviously the framing doesn't match there. I'm just going to delete that particular window and go back to the original frame. But you can see here if I select this one, I've set the jam and sash measurements uh, to be very thin to match the framing of my greenhouse. And I've used classes to assign the same textures as I've used on the framework of the greenhouse. So hopefully that answers your question, Garrett. Um, is there an image horizon view tool for a 3D view rather than drawing a large... Let me just see the rest of your question, Michael. Sorry, I'm just uh, going to minimize that slightly. Let's see other than drawing a large diameter circle. Uh, no, there isn't. Um, you do, you, well, you can, you can add a background to your render. So, um, yes, you can always do that. Um, in here, I'm just in an OpenGL view, but you can always assign a background. So if we go back to the sheet layer, um, this photorealistic view here, has a background, a sky background, but I guess what you're saying is can we extend that right to the horizon? And unfortunately, no, we can't. You just have to draw a huge object. Um, well, having said that, if you were to open up your model, if you're a Vectorworks service select user and you wanted to present your model on an iPad with the Vectorworks Nomad app, that now has some rather lovely 3D backgrounds which do include a sort of infinite ground plane. Um, for presenting your model. So hopefully that answers your question, even though it may not be quite the answer that you're looking for. Any other questions? No, that was it for question, Tamsin. Great improvements, by the way. Wow. Okay. So I think I'm... Well, have... I, it, it's yeah. lovely, yeah. Yes. I will have to take back the screen and make myself... The Please do. Let me see. Okay. Okay. You should be able to see my screen now, right? Yes. I can indeed, yes. Okay. So hopefully everybody else can, yes. Yes. Thank you so much, Tamsin. That was so, you know, beautiful. Really stunning rendering. Wow. Um, You're I, very welcome. Yes. I would like to thank everybody for attending. Thank you from the Novetch team. And I want to remind everybody to visit our page at novetch.com and check out Vectorworks Slam 2015 and Tamsin Manual. And if you live in the UK, check out uh, Tamsin Company and get back to work's landmark directly from her. Novetch is, it is the best way to buy design software online. For information on the latest special and releases, join the Novetch Network on Facebook, Google Plus and Twitter and subscribe to the Novetch blog. A reminder that the upcoming webinar will be uh, with Maxwell Render, uh, v3.1 and its cool new feature. And to rewatch today's webinar or previous ones, check out our Novage YouTube and Vimeo channels, our webinar playlist as webinars for every software taste. Thanks again for joining us and have a wonderful day or night. Uh, right, Tamsin? Thank you so much for taking your time. Your webinars are always lovely and uh, we learned a lot about the new features of Afterwards Landmark 2015, and I know a lot of uh, attendees are ready to purchase. So come visit us, Knowledge or Tamsin, uh, as soon as you can. You'll have a great time. Thank you, Tamsin. Thank you very much. And um, to the next webinar together. Looking forward to it already. Thank you again. Bye-bye, okay. everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.